Hello, I'm Eric Christensen, and thank you for joining us for this webinar. I'm joined today by Frédéric Ducolombier, ESG Director at Scientific Beta, who is going to tell us more about how to reconcile ESG and factor investing. Hello, Frédéric. Thank you for joining us. Factor investing in the equity space is increasingly popular, and so is ESG, ESG investing, which brings the need to combine the two. Some providers claim that by integrating the two approaches, ESG can add to the financial returns of factor investing, thereby blurring the lines between the drivers of ESG performances and financial performances, and even denying any potential conflicts between the two. We will explore today in more detail how ESG objectives can be reconciled with factor investing, and also why there is a need to keep the two objectives separate. If you have a question during the webinar, please submit it through your interface, and we will try to answer it before the session is over. Over to you, Frederick. Thank you, Eric. Yes, uh, there is the need to reconcile ESG and factor investing since uh, they are both so, uh, so popular, and uh, there are uh, various reasons uh, why you would like to incorporate ESG into multi-factor investing. As you mentioned, it could be uh, to uh, improve uh, the performance of your uh, multi-factor uh, portfolio uh, or multi-factor index. And this could be done if ESG uh, itself was a factor uh, to be added to the menu, or um, if you could use ESG data to improve the risk parameter of your existing factors. So uh, that's, a, that's a possibility. Another possibility is that uh, you wish to uh, protect against uh, ESG risks that may not be material in uh, your, your history, uh, but could materialize in, uh, in the future. And uh, you can think of reducing uh, the uh, exposure to reputational risk on the part of the investor. Or if you look at the portfolio, obviously, the uh, ESG risks that could have financial materiality on the components of the uh, portfolio. And naturally, there's the uh, traditional justification for incorporating ESG in a portfolio, um, i.e. the demands of ethical and socially responsible uh, investment. So it would be uh, dissociating from activities that are incompatible with the uh, investor values uh, or for uh, SRI, the promotion of a, a progressive uh, ESG uh, agenda. So um, the question of uh, performance is, uh, is key to many uh, investors. And uh, fortunately, we have 40 years of uh, ESG funds and uh, indices uh, that we can look at to determine whether there's any um, benefit or a penalty from uh, incorporating ESG in management. And the result of 40 years of uh, studies uh, uh, are that uh, there is no such uh, benefit or penalty. The performance is uh, undistinguishable from traditional uh, forms. Uh, so, of course, you can uh, look beyond what people have been doing and try and find uh, strategies that uh, use ESG data. So you look at simulated portfolios and see if uh, there could be uh, an ESG factor uh, built from, uh, from this portfolio. Well, there's been uh, an abundant uh, large amount of uh, studies uh, trying to uh, create an ESG and test an ESG portfolio, and the result is that there is no significant support from a non-redundant ESG factor, a factor that would add to the existing factors that uh, investors uh, use. So um, there's still uh, hope uh, on the uh, risk uh, estimation front. Uh, and there, there are a few exploratory studies that find that you could improve uh, the estimation of your parameters using ESG data, uh, but uh, the benefits are of somewhat limited uh, importance. So nothing uh, major uh, there. So, based on these 40 years of results, how do you incorporate ESG into your multi-factor indices? Well, since the uh, evidence um, saying that you should uh, change your multi-factor portfolio construction uh, approach is underwhelming, uh, we keep it as it is and we incorporate ESG considerations uh, by exclusionary screening as a first step. Then we build the portfolio on the screen universe. So that means that there is no compensation between ESG and financial considerations. Uh, the exclusions that we perform are determined only by uh, the ESG characteristics of securities. And uh, we do so as well uh, without allowing any compensation between constituents. 
that means the low performance of some constituents cannot be uh, offset by the high performance of uh, other constituents, which happens when you are targeting an average performance, as some providers do. And uh, we do not allow compensation across ESG screens. We uh, require that AV uh, constituent pass uh, each of the ESG uh, screens uh, independently. So this allows us to have um, strategies that uh, strictly respect the uh, ethical and SRI uh, constraints uh, that have a very conservative treatment of uh, ESG uh, risk. We don't assume that uh, this can be averaged. And uh, this is a very transparent approach as well that sends some very clear signals to the divested companies and uh, the stakeholders. The next step is to uh, build the uh, multi-factor uh, index on the screened uh, universe. And within the screened universe, the ESG considerations are not entering uh, into the uh, factor-based security selections, uh, which are aiming uh, to uh, assume uh, rewarded risks for, uh, for performance. And uh, the ESG considerations are not uh, driving the constituent weighting uh, either. So uh, this remains focused on the diversification of idiosyncratic risks. So the idea is that we are protecting these uh, sources of uh, returns in multi-factor investing that have been scientifically validated over the last 50 years. Okay. Scientific Vita has added an ESG option to its uh, fiduciary risk controls. What is the purpose and what are the features of this option? Yes, thank you, Eric. Well, the idea of the fiduciary option is to be available across the entire multi-factor offering, and it can be combined with uh, other risk control options, such as the uh, sector neutrality or the market beta adjustment, for example. And uh, what it does, it, it provides investors with versions of the multi-factor indices that uh, they are familiar with that uh, incorporate ESG dimensions in respect of uh, concerns that uh, enjoy very wide consensus and using an approach that is also very consensual. This approach is uh, negative screening. That's the oldest and most practiced, uh, most transparent ESG incorporation uh, approach. And uh, we anchor uh, our exclusions on uh, global norms and widely shared investor concerns to avoid any um, issue with, uh, with values. The themes of the uh, ESG fiduciary uh, option are controversial weapons, tobacco, coal, uh, violation of fundamental norms and uh, shareholder rights. And uh, these correspond to issues for which global norms uh, exist. And we either um, exclude because a company is in contra contravention of a global norm or uh, when its product is at odds with the norm itself. For example, uh, as far as uh, tobacco uh, is concerned, there is nothing uh, preventing uh, companies from uh, selling tobaccos or producing tobaccos, uh, but uh, these activities are at odds with the uh, World Health Organization uh, Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, whose objective is to uh, dramatically reduce the prevalence of uh, tobacco. So we exclude companies that are uh, producing tobacco or uh, distributing tobacco when this uh, is a significant share of their, of their revenues. Likewise, uh, it's not uh, forbidden to uh, extract, uh, deal uh, coal or even burn coal, uh, but uh, we know that uh, to respect the uh, objectives of the Paris Agreement, uh, coal consumption has to be reduced dramatically in the next 30 years. So uh, there we exclude coal uh, companies and companies with large uh, coal involvement uh, out of respect uh, for this uh, global norm, uh, the uh, Paris, uh, Paris Agreement. The second conduct-based exclusion that we perform is in respect of corporate governance and specifically shareholders' rights. Uh, in reference to the OECD principles of uh, corporate governance that recognize um, voting rights as a core shareholder right, we exclude companies that uh, do not provide uh, public uh, stockholders with uh, voting rights. Uh, this is backed by uh, significant uh, engagement efforts on the part of investors that have approached regulators and index providers to try and crack down on companies that do not respect the proportionality uh, between the capital provided and uh, the voting rights. So we only concentrate on those extreme cases, uh, those companies that uh, completely uh, deny uh, voting rights to public shareholders and uh, as a result are not accountable 
uh, to uh, the public and the shareholders. Um, and uh, well, you know, uh, when you are thinking of ESG uh, matters, uh, well, engagement of such companies is uh, futile, uh, obviously. So um, this um, ESG option is appropriate for uh, a cross-section of uh, investors, um, investors with different uh, motives. It's relevant for value-based investors uh, who care about uh, dissociating from investments that uh, fail, that flout uh, global norms. Uh, it's also relevant for uh, socially responsible investors that uh, care about these global norms and want to promote uh, their, uh, their development. But uh, it makes sense for business case investors as well, uh, because uh, they avoid the reputational risk and sometimes liability risk that are uh, associated with uh, uh, investments in uh, companies uh, that uh, fail and contravene uh, these, uh, these norms. Um, there's also uh, reduced exposure to investment that may disappoint in terms of risk-adjusted performance uh, because of uh, the metallization of uh, high ESG risk. So there the assumption is that uh, this low ESG performance uh, proxies for, uh, for risk. And then if you think of universal owners, uh, then uh, promoting uh, global norms is to uh, promote promoting uh, reduction in the externalities that are affecting the uh, the whole portfolio. So even though a company may benefit uh, from flouting uh, a norm, uh, this is harming other companies and is detrimental to uh, the portfolio. So it's possible to justify uh, the relevance of this uh, option uh, for value investors, for uh, SRI investors, and for traditional investors. So, in terms of uh, financial, but also in terms of ESG, what are the risks and performances of this uh, ESG fiduciary option? Yes, thank you, Eric. Let's look at the uh, ESG performance uh, first. So, uh, by virtue of negative filtering, all the uh, controversial products and uh, activities uh, that we were targeting uh, by, with the filters uh, have been uh, removed at uh, the uh, thresholds that uh, we, we defined. So uh, what you see in the table is, uh, well, uh, zeros everywhere uh, in the ESG options. These controversial uh, securities have been removed from the universe and therefore they've been removed from uh, the indices as well. Uh, you have one uh, figure there that's in red that shows that uh, naturally our uh, multi-beta, multi-strategy uh, indices, uh, when they're not sector control, tend to load heavily on uh, utilities and um, they uh, do uh, tilt towards uh, some of the dirtiest uh, utilities. Uh, we have four, over 4% 4 uh, of the index invested in uh, utilities with more than 30% uh, of coal in their power generation mix. This is totally uh, removed by the uh, coal filter uh, of, the, of the option. Now, importantly, uh, when uh, you um, perform uh, ESG screening, uh, you uh, reduce the universe. Uh, you uh, therefore can wonder whether the uh, sources of performance uh, of your multi-factor index construction have been severely affected by uh, the screening of the universe. So what uh, we look at uh, here uh, are the two main sources of performance, uh, which are factor tilting and uh, diversification. And uh, first, in terms of uh, factor uh, potential uh, for, for, for performance, we see that uh, the total factor intensity uh, of uh, the index uh, is not uh, negatively affected by uh, screening. There's a slight uh, improvement, in fact, in uh, factor intensity. So it doesn't look like uh, there uh, are fewer opportunities to harvest uh, good uh, factor exposure for, uh, for performance. Now, uh, if you look at the uh, GLR uh, measure, which measure, measures uh, the uh, quality of diversification of the index by comparing the uh, variance of the index to uh, the uh, average variance of the uh, constituents uh, of the index, uh, you see that, uh, well, the uh, standard index has uh, significantly lower 
uh, GLR measure than the cap weighted index, showing that uh, it is uh, diversifying better than uh, cap weighting uh, of constituents. And uh, if you look at the ESG option, uh, well, you see no uh, significant difference, and uh, even for uh, the standard index, a slight uh, improvement in, uh, in diversification. So there's no diversification penalty that is felt, even though uh, you have a, a smaller uh, universe, our um, weighting schemes uh, that uh, use scientific diversification are still able to find uh, opportunities to reduce uh, the risk of, uh, of the index. So uh, the traditional sources of performance of multi-factor investing, smart multi-factor investing have been uh, preserved here. So uh, when you look at the results, uh, we uh, see that the performances uh, of standard and ESG fiduciary options uh, are broadly in line over uh, 10 years. Um, altogether, uh, there is an outperformance of over 2% uh, per annum over 10 years for uh, the uh, standard non-sector control version of these indices with or without ESG uh, option and, uh, well, uh, slightly less than 2% uh, for the uh, sector controlled versions of, uh, of, the, uh, of the indices. So um, there is not uh, any uh, indication here that uh, we are paying a uh, price for whatever ESG benefits uh, we are deriving uh, from uh, this uh, filtering. To summarize uh, the points of this discussion, uh, support is lacking to justify uh, ESG integration into multi-factor portfolio construction, uh, at least on the strength of uh, traditional risk and performance uh, characteristics, but it still makes sense uh, to incorporate ESG if you want to address uh, hedge uh, ESG risks that may have some potential materiality in, uh, in the future. Uh, or if you need to pursue ethical or socially responsible uh, goals. So our um, ESG option uh, incorporate ESG uh, into our flagship uh, indices in respect of issues that are very consensual and uh, in a manner that uh, is relevant to uh, ethical investors, socially responsible investors and also business case uh, investors. The good news is that the filtering of the universe does not reduce the potential for outperformance from uh, factor exposures as the factor intensity uh, of the indices remains uh, the same or slightly better than uh, the non-screened uh, indices and uh, it does not prevent our uh, weighting schemes from diversifying idiosyncratic risk. So the uh, traditional sources of performance of our smart multi-factor portfolio construction are preserved. And we observed that over the last 10 years, the uh, ESG filtered indices and the regular indices perform in line. Thank you, Frederick. Now, Frederick. over to the questions. So, first question. When you exclude companies, you can't engage with them. Don't you think engagement is an effective policy? Well, it's quite customary to oppose engagement uh, and divestment, uh, what people call voice uh, versus exit, but I think it's a false uh, opposition. Uh, an investor can exit with voice, can exit and make its voice heard, and that sends a very powerful signal to the affected company. Um, it's also possible to retain your voice even after you exited. Um, or to have a voice even if you're not invested. I mean, you have all these uh, NGOs uh, out there that have very strong voices, very strong influence on, on companies and the public uh, without ever being invested in any significant way. So an investor that can decide to enter or re-enter the capital of a company as an ad ad additional dimension uh, of uh, leverage uh, on, the, on that company. So I... Uh, no, I, I don't uh, think you can really oppose uh, those two things. Um, in addition, uh, engagement is futile uh, when there is no other outcome that uh, would be acceptable to the investor uh, than the uh, company seizing operations. Think of tobacco, uh, for example, what is there to engage uh, there. So there's a, there's a room for uh, divestment uh, for, for sure. Uh, last but not least, uh, divestment brings teeth 
to uh, engagement policies. The possibility of divestment is a powerful tool in the hands of the investor that's trying to influence uh, the company. But for this tool to remain effective, it has to be used from time to time. Uh, so uh, otherwise, engagement will lead to, uh, to nowhere. And um, of course, the performance of engagement uh, strategies is hard uh, to measure. And uh, there's also the risk of reverse uh, influence in engagement with the company uh, being influencing the uh, the uh, the investor, and uh, it's also possible to claim you are doing engagement to do business as usual. It's very good uh, cover for for greenwashing. So uh, you have room for both investment and uh, engagement and uh, divestment, and um, I think it's it's sound to have uh, both on the table. Okay, thank you. So second question. You didn't show any ESG scores in your presentation. Why don't you report an average ESG score for your portfolios? Yes, uh, we do not report average uh, ESG scores uh, because we do not consider that they are informative. On um, an ESG performance level, an average score means that you can offset the weaknesses of some companies with the strengths of other companies. Uh, Casual observation reveals, but you also have studies that document that uh, individuals tend to react much more strongly to poor performances than, uh, well, um, strengths. I mean, people tend to be quite indifferent to, uh, to strengths uh, in uh, ESG. Uh, so it's unlikely that the average investor will consider that the human rights uh, violations of one portfolio component uh, will be offset by the uh, Corporate Social Responsibility Award of another component uh, in, the, uh, in the portfolio. Uh, naturally, for investors that follow a deontological approach, that is uh, just an insult. Uh, it's obscene to, to think about this. Uh, but even for a business as usual uh, investor, uh, the mere assumption of controversy risk aversion invalidates this idea that you can offset uh, company strengths and, and weaknesses. So this, uh, at the performance level, it doesn't mean uh, it doesn't mean much. So we don't report this. It could be it could be mis mis uh, misleading. Now, um, if you regard this uh, constituent level uh, ESG ratings as proxies for risk, then when you use an average, uh, in the, that's what you do when you report, uh, or even worse, when you use the average to select your companies. Uh, you assume that there is a linear relationship between the rating and uh, risk. So uh, this is not a conservative assumption. Uh, what uh, we do is we exclude the companies with the low performances or the high uh, risks, and uh, we assume that uh, these may be uh, disproportionately at, at, at risk. So we are conservative here. Uh, so that's the reason why um, these are the reasons why we uh, do not include uh, average uh, ESG rating at the portfolio level uh, in our reporting, and uh, we don't uh, consider this uh, in our index construction either. Okay. Thank you, Frederick. So, to sum it up, we believe ESG investing is also, and perhaps foremost, about favoring positive ESG outcomes. But, as you said earlier, the good news is that ESG investing can be reconciled with factor investing without losing any of its benefits. For more thoughts and detail on the topic, please consult our white paper, which is available on our website, scientificbeta.com. Feel free also to send more questions to webinar at scientificbeta.com. Lastly, please follow us on social media. We are present on LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you for watching today, and goodbye.